By now you would be aware of the self-directed approach. You're probably in the process of implementing it in some form. For organisations and their senior managers, this is a time of great change in which long-established systems will need to be reconsidered. Agencies used to be able to rely on a certain amount of funding based on the number of people they supported. This made budgeting easy. They knew how much they had for things like staffing, facilities and services. Now the funding is attached to the individual who can take it wherever they like. How do agencies provide a sustainable list of services? The self-directed approach is a model of service delivery that basically um, promotes the maximum autonomy for service users. When a person comes to the organisation, we ask them, what would you like to do? Not, you know, have a look at this program and, and see what's on there that you might like to do. It's really about the person now and um, what they want to achieve in their life. Service users now uh, are able to choose whether they want to access the community, whether they want to manage the funding themselves, whether they want to purchase day programs and a combination of individual support. So they might have a, a staff member who comes out to their home and, and goes out with them on a one-to-one -one basis and then a couple of days where they come in and they're involved in a group activity. So it's quite flexible. There certainly has had to be a shift from moving from what was a charity or welfare based model to something that's much more run along the lines of a business model. And the need to do that is because you've got to be a lot more transparent with the dollars that you're managing. We need to be mindful of how we can ensure financial sustainability for the organisation by providing value for money services. And we'll know when we're not doing that because our bottom line will be affected. The transport that we provide or, or don't provide, it's the cost of the services, all of those things now families are considering before they come in. There's a, you know, a marketing consideration now. Branding is very important. Recently we've started a Twitter account and Facebook and those things get our name out there a bit more and hopefully build a relationship with the community in general, not just service users, but the community more broadly. Uh, it will also make our job easier when we do try and engage with the community in specific partnerships or projects. The philosophy of a self-directed approach is, is fantastic and it's definitely how we want staff to be working. We want people to have choice in every aspect of um, uh, their lives. Um, however, in, in terms of the cost of um, individual support and um, wants versus what we can provide for the funding that people get. Sometimes that's a bit of a challenge. As an organisation, we are coming together and, and, and sharing resources and, and expertise. The expertise that the people are bringing with them, we're able to put right across, across the organisation. Um, we've got outreach working with um, the, the day services, uh, linking into to the same sorts of programs. So it's, it's no longer a, an us against them, it, it's a, a united front. One of the important things for organisations is to get more involved with other organisations, to share, share resources, to share ideas and to develop partnerships. And some of the ways that we've been able to do that at past is through the Enhancing Sector Capacity Grants um, through the department. Some of the challenges that this self-directed approach bring for staffing is a, there's a, a considerable shift in how they've um, been trained to deliver support services. People providing direct support to our service users should have wide and varied backgrounds. Uh, I think that it's really easy for organisations to be disability centric in who they recruit and retain. Um, there's no guarantee of quality supports just because somebody holds an industry specific qualification. Does this person have the emotional intelligence for taking this model of support forward and, um, and helping the participant to, to grow and make choices and self-direct? There are people who are wanting to downsize who have experience in, in many other industries and bringing that um, wide experience on board has been great for us. We're asking staff today to 
be on the feet problem solvers, to be um, people that understand how community development works. And again, that wasn't part of the training when they're providing support in a centre-based service arrangement. The culture has had to change. It was very much um, a staff and client relationship in the past um, where the staff said what would happen and the clients just followed and did what they were pretty much told. We're asking them to facilitate, to stand back and not always do everything for everybody but allow that individual to, to make choices and take and take those steps in the direction that they want to take. It's really about getting the staff now to introduce new activities and new experiences for people so that they can learn from them. We have a, a bit of a hard time getting staff to provide the one-to-one -one support. They short, tend to be short shifts. Ultimately, what you have to have then is a flexible workforce and that's a challenge in itself. When people want support may not match with when people want to work. Broadening hours of work and all of those sorts of things certainly have um, implications with the way we talk to our support workers, the way we negotiate with the union, the way we negotiate, uh, negotiate our agreements. We're also part of um, a workplace planning and project with, um, with PAST to look at um, sharing some staffing resources. To retain staff, and we have quite a good retention rate, um, we, we are a registered training organisation. We already share um, one staffing position where the person works part-time for us and part-time for PAST. We've certainly been able to employ quite a high calibre of person because we were able to, between the two of us, offer a full-time job where neither of us could actually afford to have a full-time person. I guess there's been quite a bit of challenge around ensuring that we communicate fully with all our stakeholders in this transition to self-directed approaches. We talk openly about what we're doing, about the changes that have come down from government perhaps, the changes that have come down from um, Life Without Barriers, the pol our policies and procedures, and we have team meetings for that. We also have one-to-one -one staff supervision and feedback, we have a, a quite a robust feedback mechanism. We checked in with staff, we actually asked them what their idea of a self-directed approach was and what that meant in their um, day-to-day -day work and if they had any questions we talked through examples of, of what it meant um, and we also talked about some of the challenges so if they felt that they there were barriers to providing um, you know working in that way we talked through those barriers and how they could address some of those problems. One of the ways that we've worked with the families to sort of bring them along with all of this is to provide a, a family liaison Worker. Her role is, um, is to go out and meet face to face with families and, and talk to them about um, well, the Disability Act, the quality framework, um, self-directed approaches, all of those sorts of things so that the families are far more aware of why we're doing what we're doing. We have stepped up our um, presence within our, um, the community, inviting ourselves to a whole range of traditional, um, I guess, opportunities such as the local lines group and rotary groups. A lot more of the activities are run in the community, so services would um, provide the support in the community for the person or the person would just access something that was happening. And sharing I guess in some of that community education needs to occur so that the community are ready to receive and have an open door approach and an understanding why a service that was once centre based um, is now bringing their stakeholders out into the community. It's about uh, looking at things creatively, working out what the person wants and then looking at the community and what the community can provide in terms of supporting that person to achieve their goals. We've worked a lot on creating partnerships but we've actually done it from taking the person with the disability into their own home community. That's where we've started. So rather than them coming into a um, facility each day, we're actually supporting them directly from their home into their community. 
What I find exciting about self-directed approaches is that it's, uh, it gives organisations leverage to actually work up to the rhetoric. I'm determined to see it through because it's right, it's, it's morally right, it's philosophically right. It offers us the opportunity to build partnerships with business and um, other community groups. So it's exciting, it's exciting um, for the organisation, it's exciting for the, the service users in terms of um, yeah, how, how we can provide services. I think the challenge for many of our services is to see beyond being a a charity be your charity or a welfare model and broaden your horizons um, you're still able to support the the people that you set out as an organization to support but in a, a range of different ways that allows that person to continue to grow and make choices as leaders of change senior managers and their organizations have a responsibility to educate staff and families about the self-directed approach Keeping in mind the individual and fostering a culture of open communication will allow you to work through challenges as they arise.